let's start with what is Ibogaine and where does it come from? I learned after I heard the word Ibogaine for the very first time on July the 29th of 22. And oh it my is God, a, you remember the moment? Oh, it's, I it's chills. everything that has happened since that day has just been unbelievable. And it's a day that will be in my mind for as long as I have one. Ibogaine is an alkaloid that is derived from three West African botanical sources. The mother plant is the iboga root. The iboga root is indigenous to West Africa, primarily Gabon. It translates also into Cameroon and, and other places in close proximity. It has been used in West African rituals for uh, a group of folks called the Bawidis for centuries right. as part of their spiritual and cultural traditions. I learned recently, and I can't pronounce the exact word, uh, the Bawidis treat the iboga root as the mother pearl of their entire civilization. And when it comes to its use in cultural and religious ceremony, they have a word that they use to describe it, which translates in English to eaten God. Wow. It has been recognized just... as a uh, profound facilitator of an internal experience that has profound impact on the individual who receives it, thus its place in Bawidi culture and, and religious practice. In the late, in the, in the early 1960s, <clears throat> there was a gentleman by the name of Howard Lotsoff who had had heroin dependency for several years. He was part of a cultural movement back then that was referred to as the Beatniks, kind of the of course. hippie precursors. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Mr. Lotsoff was kind of an omnivorous substance user, and he found himself in an environment where someone had some again. In his 60s? He was in, this was in 1962. You know, the only reason I interrupt you here for a second is because I've never heard of this until now, but everybody knows they were all dropping acid. Yes. Drop in and drop out. So I'm really surprised, but... Was it prevalent then and somehow got lost in the mix? It was not prevalent. It was recently, uh, th that was its first discovery got by it. someone okay. who was within the, the, the addiction drug oh, use I'm sorry, keep at going. that time. So in, in 1962, Howard Lonsoff, with his years-long heroin dependency, came into contact with Ibogaine. And he took it because he just was curious as to what it would do. On the other side of his experience, what he noticed the most was that his desire for heroin was gone. And he did not ever take heroin again. It, his desire for it was gone. And as importantly, he did not experience any sort of withdrawal syndrome whatsoever, despite his years of intensive heroin use. It was unheard of, and it was a miraculous outcome. So this started Ibogaine's journey through the consciousness of the United States, specifically as Howard Lotsoff and his wife Norma, along with friends of theirs, uh, Dana Beal. Uh, there is a guy by the name, uh, whose last name is Cisco, Dr. Kenneth Alper, Dr. Deborah Mash, and others, over the course of decades, performed a variety of observational field studies in Ibogaine's application to opioid dependency. And what the result net total has been of what I would describe as research that is decades wide and mountains high is that Ibogaine as an alkaloid has the unique ability to completely resolve physiological opioid dependence within an accelerated time frame, meaning 36 to 48 hours for 80% of individuals who take it but one time. That number goes to 97% if an individual receives a second supportive dose in the event they are continuing to experience withdrawal symptoms after that first treatment. It is an extraordinary compound. What has been learned recently going back to, you know, the, the 20, 2010s forward, is that Ibogaine appears to have advanced neurotherapeutic properties that regenerate 
brain tissue, something that not, nothing known to modern science can do. This discovery has occurred within the context of U.S. Special Forces veterans who have been engaged in post-9-11 conflicts, whether it's Iraq, if Afghanistan, or elsewhere, who have come home with both the physical and psychological wounds of war as they have sought treatment from the Veterans Administration with the blunt instruments of pharmacology that they have with which to treat these complex conditions. Many of these veterans have not found those treatments to be effective. Not only have they not found them to be effective, but they have found themselves trapped in a cycle by which they take medications that don't resolve their problems right. while producing a series of side effects right. that essentially anesthetize the soul and slowly euthanize the body. And as these veterans have struggled with profound symptoms of post-traumatic stress, treatment-resistant anxiety and depression, and suicidal ideation, they as a last-ditch resort have made what in their minds and in many cases has been the insane decision to travel to clinics that operate south of the American border in Mexico to receive treatment with this exotic, sounds too good to be true, substance called Ibogaine. At this point, thousands of U.S. Special Forces veterans whose next stop is the graveyard yeah. have gone to Mexico in a last-ditch effort to save their lives. And uh, through the process of what has been treatment outcomes that are genuinely miraculous. A study was conducted by Stanford University, and Stanford University and its researcher, Dr. Nolan Williams, essentially studied a cohort of 30 veterans who had traveled to a clinic south of Tijuana in Mexico called the Ambio Clinic mm -hmm. uh, to receive Ibogaine treatment for symptoms of post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. The results of that Stanford study illustrate that a single Ibogaine treatment brought the symptomatology of those two conditions into almost complete remission for the cohort of 30 veterans who were studied and followed after the delivery of a single treatment. Radiographic studies... Forgive me, for, for context, before, yes, what's a radiographic study? An MRI. Oh, got it, uh, okay. <clears throat> a, Sorry. A, a scan of your you know, anatomy that Understood. shows us what's going on with it. Got it. So as part of this study, Dr. Williams had performed functional MRIs before and after treatment for each of these veterans. And his research team at Stanford comprised a um, database that was an algorithmic uh, of brain age covering the entire human lifespan through late adulthood. And this is a database that has hundreds of thousands of images of, of healthy adult brains so that there can be a baseline for what the healthy brain anatomy looks like, how it compares to the traumatic brain injury conditions that these veterans had, and then after the Ibogaine treatment, what if any physiological changes occurred within the brain to explain... Of course. The symptomological What's the me mechanism by which you're yes, seeing these insane results? Of course. Yes, ma'am. So the MRIs after a single Ibogaine treatment revealed the following things. And, and before I even get into what it revealed, when the data was first run, Dr. Williams sent his research team back to the drawing board because he believed the results to be in error because the results produced were unbelievable. So he said, this cannot be correct. Delete everything redo everything, and let's see if these results are replicated, and they were. The results were these. The white matter that covers the surface of the brain, it's the highway across which all of our thoughts and impulses travel, grew and thickened in size within the brains of every one of these veterans. The centers of the brain responsible for emotional regulation and executive functioning grew in size. The average reversal of brain age was one and a half years with a cohort of four veterans seeing their brains reverse in age by almost five years. Before, of, well, I'm sorry, one treatment? One treatment, one treatment. One when, treatment is one dose or the two doses equal one treatment? Well, when Ibogaine is delivered by the two clinics with which I'm familiar, one being the Ambio Clinic that participated in the Stanford study sponsored by VETS, which okay. is a Veterans Exploring Treatment Solutions. Amber and Marcus Capone founded that organization. There is another clinic in Cancun called Beyond, and that's B-E-O-N-D. Those, those are the two clinics that operate at volume and they're the ones with which I am the most familiar they deliver Ibogaine by capsule 
and the amount and the dosage is determined by body weight. So when a person goes in for an Ibogaine treatment, it is done in a clinically controlled medical setting. The individual is given capsules that contain Ibogaine, and the dosage is body weight dependent. Understood. And a person then lays down in bed, and within about an hour, they may start to, you know, hear like a little buzzing sound in their ears. And then there is the onset of what is called ataxia, which is essentially a state of semi-paralysis where there is, with the exertion of force through your limbs, a tremulousness that prevents you from essentially being able to support your own body weight. Wow. It is a very physically demanding, taxing, and often unpleasant experience. But despite that, the end result for almost everyone who takes it for a life-threatening condition is well worth that difficulty. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the podcast, please like, comment, subscribe, and share. And make sure to let me know what guests you want to see on in the future.